Rheumatic heart disease is caused by rheumatic fever, a preventable illness that can cause major heart problems. In the NT, we have some of the highest recorded rates of rheumatic heart disease in the world, with most cases recorded in indigenous communities. More than 2,500 Territorians are affected by the disease that has all been but eradicated from the developed world. Housing and health education are the keys to the prevention. That was the message to the 130 people in Darwin Q&A event on rheumatic heart disease. Tonight we will ask why rheumatic heart disease still exists in Australia and what more should be done to eliminate it. That's the first uh, question we're going to address. And we want to tell you that it is unbelievably 100% preventable. It is very preventable, but rheumatic heart disease continues to devastate our children, our families and their communities. I didn't really, as I said before, know too much about heart disease and, and if I don't, then I wonder who does. I, I mean, this might be the converted out here tonight that we're talking to, but I think generally out there people don't know, you know. They don't know too much about it. Our challenge is to take this from this room tonight and give it to the broader community and make them aware of it. Make government aware of it tonight. We're glad to see the ministers here. We want government to be aware of it. We want everyone to be aware of it because this is a silent killer that sneaks up at night, sneaks up during the day and doesn't go away. Now, rheumatic heart disease starts just simply with a sore throat, a simple infection caused by a strep A germ. It's easily treated with antibiotics. So that, that's where it starts. Simple as that. But untreated, this simple infection can then result in rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever is uh, an autoimmune response which causes inflammation in the joints, the skin, the brain, and more dangerously, in the heart. While rheumatic fever is a short-term illness, it can cause long-term damage to the heart, and this is what we call rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic heart disease is a chronic, disabling, and sometimes fatal disease. But the causes of rheumatic disease are more than just medical. How and where people are born, grow, live, work and age are all incredibly important. Rheumatic heart disease affects more than 32 million people around the world. 32 million people are affected by it around the world. Nearly 300,000 people die every year from rheumatic heart disease. This year, 300,000. Last year, 300,000. Next year, 300,000. It just continues to go on. Most of these are in Africa. Of course, the Middle East and Asia, uh, places that we know as third world or developing uh, nations. Uh, there are hardly any cases in developed first world countries like this one of ours. Uh, so many people think that a rheumatic heart disease is history, but it isn't. It isn't. Australia has the highest rate of rheumatic heart disease in the world with Indigenous people at most risk. Now here's the problem because when it becomes an, a, a real problem for Australia through Indigenous people only, it just gets forgotten. It just gets pushed aside. It just needs more voices standing up saying this is unacceptable. This is unacceptable. We have to do much more about it. The disease demonstrates all too clearly uh, the inequalities in social circumstances here in Australia. Uh, rheumatic heart disease is not an Indigenous disease, but there are nearly 6,000 people on rheumatic heart disease registers across Australia. More than 90% of these are Indigenous. There are probably many more undetected. Nearly 100% of all recorded cases of rheumatic fever are amongst Indigenous people. And Indigenous people are up to 20 times more likely to die than non-Indigenous people from rheumatic heart disease. So with the help of you, our audience, our wonderful panel and people living with rheumatic heart disease who we're going to hear from in just a moment, we're going to ask three questions. How does this disease impact families and communities? Why does a third world disease still exist in Australia? And what more should be done to end rheumatic heart disease? I was um, diagnosed with rheumatic fever at the age of five, back in 1985. When I was getting a bit older, I uh, uh, didn't want to take my medicines, so that pretty much led on to uh, rheumatic heart disease. So, um, 1992, I had my first, I had my first open heart surgery, and um, and the complications happened with the heart valves, and then pretty much after that, 96, I had another open heart surgery, 2001, another surgery, uh, 2006. Another one, and then my last one was in uh, 2014. 
<laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, so pretty much uh, just the complications. <clears throat> he explained to me, you know, I've got to go into surgery. This is what's going to happen after. And this is what I want you to do. Hello, everyone. My name is Kenya. I'm 20 years old. I had my mitral valve repaired when I was 14. 14? Yep, 14. 2011. On the 27th of September at 2 o'clock. <laughs> um, I'm the eldest of five other children. My mother repeatedly asked the clinic to check me for rheumatic fever when I was eight years old. So I was living with the sickness for a couple of years until I got really, really sick and had to have open heart surgery. Months later, Kenya had a heart attack and was later airlifted to, uh, to Darwin where she was suffering pneumonia, septicemia and an enlarged heart. So within three months of her diagnosis, she was down in Adelaide um, to have her valve repaired. How do we need to work together to get this? Whether it's we're, in, we're engaging communities in the wrong way? Are we not consulting the Indigenous communities? As, you know, the, the meeting, I, I was taking some notes and people were saying they were discussing some of the social determinants um, as part of that. And often we look at policy and, uh, you know, we've got to stop looking at health problems and we often say this in the Aboriginal health sector, we've got to stop looking at issues uh, in body parts but look at the whole person and look at this issue across the whole spectrum of that person's life. Um, so it's both. Um, I certainly think that, um, health, you know, within the health and the justice side of things as well, um, Prior to working at Nigeria, I was actually working with Dylan Dilber Health Service, and you know, moving from health to working within the justice section, you certainly see a lot of parallel drawn between you know the health issues that are faced within um, you know with Indigenous people and then within the justice system. Um, but I think certainly around the holistic, um, around holistically, um, around the housing issues, um, a few other things that are faced within the Indigenous communities, um, and I think that justice. Um, you know, as opposed to working with the justice aspect, also can contribute to the health. Um, the, the project has been going for 10 years, and I am pleased to say that the approach was holistic. So it was about prevention on the patient level. So there is a free clinic for sore throats. There is district nurses who go and visit to give the antibiotics at home. The treatment is directed towards reaching the people who need it in a concentrated fashion. And also, they took the education to schools, so because you need to educate the kids about their health, about their hygiene, and what they should do if they get sore throat. So they take the education to schools, to the churches, to any community activity that locally done by the Māori group, whether it is a celebration or a wedding or a festival, they took the education to them. And that's, again, very influential. So they have a communication with the local population and they know how to talk to them. There are a lot of resources out there now for health staff, so new health staff coming to, uh, to work in this area have access to information about rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease, so that we are doing better with diagnosis and we're doing better with treatment. So that's, a, that's another positive. Um, uh, unfortunately, the reality, however, Charlie, is, is that, the, that unlike in New Zealand, our numbers are not decreasing as yet. We're way behind. Uh, what's been achieved in New Zealand and we can learn a lot from them and so every week we're getting a, probably about two new cases of rheumatic fever or recurrent case of rheumatic fever in the Northern Territory and there's still a need for surgery for which will be sometimes children sometimes adolescents sometimes um, adults usually younger adults uh, <coughs> every couple of every two to three weeks someone going down from the Northern Territory for surgery uh, a bit like Bart said, there is some uh, good news stories which I think we should always, uh, you know, hang on to. There are, there are. I see there are more people uh, aware and interested. We had a very good forum in Queensland where we had the Honourable Ken White was up there in Queensland. We had a parliamentary breakfast and instantly when he heard the story, as I said again, you know, you can write all the policies and that, but once you hear a story, it sort of resonates with people. And uh, he was there to listen to Eddie's story, and he 
took that straight back to um, Parliament and started talking to other people. He actually invited um, our government relation person down to speak to him again. We've lob lobbied very hard and advocated very hard in the Hart Foundation for over years and years uh, to maintain um, you, you know, the funding for the rheumatic heart disease strategy and also to raise that awareness, uh, being strong advocates for it. The schools in New Zealand have a nurse. The children will not come if they have an infectious disease, including streptococcus, skin or throat. And also, the education have made its way to, as I was saying earlier on, to any venue that the Maori population and the white population come to. So rugby matches, uh, you know, uh, celebrations, festivals, education have gone there to speak to the people in their own terms and in their own language and in their own uh, uh, presence. Is that with early diagnosis and treatment of the skin sores, you should be able to get the kids back to school really quickly. So I think if you can diagnose and treat the, the sore throats and the skin mm. sores, you don't need to exclude them for very long at all. And um, that's one of the things that's part of policy that's, I think Anna Ralph in the audience has could tell us what the actual formal policy is going to be on how long children should be excluded from school with skin sores, because that's an important point. You've got to diagnose it to treat them, but once you've treated them, you can get them back pretty quickly in um, 24 hours. So the thing is, you've got to make the diagnosis, get them on treatment, and then they can get back to school and continue their education. level of accountability on the government and the health departments that they need to ensure that you know this is a something serious that could lead to something that's permanent. Um, having a Royal Commission I think the long it's a really long tedious process um, but really I think it's something that we mean need to investigate as well that um, you know we need to take health matters seriously um, regardless of whatever it is um, you know particularly with acute Rheumatic fever. But the system is just not geared to be able to respond in a proactive way uh, with Aboriginal communities. I, I'm an independent member of the Aboriginal Medical Service Alliance in the Northern Territory. We sit at the same table with the Commonwealth and the Northern Territory Government and we are constantly saying, you know, we've got to deal with these communities in a more open, transparent uh, way and we've got to get funding on the ground to these communities so that we can work with them. I totally agree with you. I think, you know, uh, uh, having to speak um, to uh, the Maori with their language, having to ask their elders what is the best way to convince the kids, having to infiltrate social structure and uh, their meetings and uh, Mariah and just go there to them is the only way to get the message through. And they can understand and they will cooperate once you get the message through, but also to genuinely wanted to invest time and effort to solve this problem. One um, resource we developed, it's called Living Every Day with My Heart Failure, and this just thousands and thousands of copies kept uh, being uh, requested because it was written with consultation from Aboriginal community, and this is across the whole of Australia, this resource was written. It was written in uh, a way that uh, people could understand, and all the uh, heart failure nurses across Australia wanted it for, for mainstream. RHD Australia, up until now, have done a good job with, um, with the resources for health staff, and, uh, and there's a lot of that available on the website. But for the next year, a big focus for RHC Australia is going to be more orientating towards those targeting those families uh, who have got rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease in the family, because they're the groups where who are most affected, obviously. And looking at that, we'll need to use um, get get advice on language in particular. So I think that that's going to be a big agenda over the next 12 months. I think at the end of the day. Um you know, it's also about getting on the same page as them as well and trying to use, you know, use the same language that they have, um, you know, particularly with our sessions. Um, we don't just... We don't go out with a presentation or, um, 
you know, we try to be as visual and try and be, you know, incorporate what do you, what would you do if this were to happen, um, you know, with their laws. Um, but I think it's, again, um, health literacy and, you know, empowering them to learn a bit more about their health and, um, you know, even with their rights within the, under the legal system. I think there hasn't been a, uh, an in-depth enough look at um, the health workforce that happens in central and northern Australia, and uh, and, and this goes to what ha what happened at Manangreta as well, and that is there's an enormous turnover of, of professional health staff, both nurses and doctors, and also um, with uh, Aboriginal health workers or Indigenous health practitioners. An Aboriginal health worker recruited from Darwin, flown out to Manangreta, can get the same entitlement as a, a non-indigenous nurse, so the rec so the recruitment policy applies to if you're if you've come from outside, somebody needs to lobby the office of the commissioner of the public employment to change the local recruitment policy so that Aboriginal health workers stay in this workforce because they are vital. Mm -hmm. They are the cultural brokers in a lot of our remote Aboriginal communities. Without them, we don't have a sustainable workforce. Surely somebody has got to be able to wake up to that fact soon. I've learned tonight from a health professional that rheumatic heart disease is preventable within 24 hours. And in terms of Manangrita, my question is, how come those children didn't present at the clinic? So my knowledge about where we're at with the health sector is that the health sector is so busy dealing with crisis management that we haven't got the preventative focus. Mm -hmm. Now, as a teacher by trade, I've got a challenge here for you, and I thank Menzies for inviting me, because I'm particularly influenced by the Menzies School of Health Research community research methodology, and that's from Mr Trudgeon there. I'm particularly influenced by it. So here's a little yarn. We've had an outbreak of syphilis in the Northern Territory mm. that we haven't seen for 30 years. So, we want to engage people. So if the people are engaged in the repairs and maintenance, if the people are engaged in the mine and new works, if the people are engaged in the new housing, then we believe there will be change. And this is about engaging local people, the new Northern Territory Government policy. Nothing's going to be easy, but we're serious about this change. And Marion, I'm really proud to say that I arm wrestled this into policy. For the first time ever, government employees in remote areas, region, regional remote area recruits, locals, have a housing entitlement. Where do we go from now? Just give us 30 seconds each, please, starting with you, Marion. We've just got to keep vigilant. We've got to keep working. And, and that's something supporting families... Um, I know on the Tiwi Islands we're doing some great work, you know, we're doing a lot of, we're trying to collaborate and work um, as a council with Menzies to, to get this happening. Uh, council, as a local government authority, we do housing, we do, we run community programs, so we're trying to, we're trying to do some of that work, Charlie, and we just need to continue to do it. Um. Yeah, I certainly think um, addressing the issue holistically, um, you know, from individuals, um, families, community, working with the health professionals, um, you know, government, federally, locally. Um, and I think it's about, you know, empowering the community at the end of the day and getting them to get the message out about this, um, you know, about this disease as well. Prevention and a cardiac surgical unit in the Northern Territory. Hopefully out of tonight there will be, at a government level, um, formal uh, involvement at some levels between education, housing and health uh, mm -hmm. around this, this issue. Um, yeah. And uh, secondly is, is that from our RHD Australia's point of view, our focus over the next year I'm hoping will be really around supporting families, those families living with rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease. So when I look at social determinants, I say social and cultural determinants and also champions. We need lots more champions. So picking up on that point of keeping the heat up with champions. We one third of the journey of, of 10 years, 12 years. We have, the new, your new government has put the child first and that links with the family. We've got to wrap around health and education and it's got to be underpinned with new infrastructure. That, that's our plan.
that, that's a 30 second plan, but it is very complex and it has great ambitions and I'm proud to be part of it.